I'm really excited to be um, chairing this next panel session um, where we have some uh, ed tech startup experts who will be spending about 10 minutes talking about uh, themselves, the, the organization and their products and services. Uh, and then we'll uh, facilitate, I'll, I'll help facilitate a uh, Q&A discussion with the audience. Um, so I'm going to invite up first uh, Lauren Lauren Gleena uh, from uh, Agape. Let me just so, uh, Lauren is the founder of Agape EdTech. As a mum, an engineer, and an educator with a career spanning space, robotics, and high-tech startups, she's passionate about seeing kids have the same opportunities that she did by creating exciting, fresh, and engaging STEM education products and experiences. Please welcome Lauren to the stage. So hi, my name's uh, Lauren Glenner, and uh, yes, I'm the founder of um, Agape, and I'm gonna talk to you today about my product, which is here. So let me click on to the next slide. So what is Agape? It's a virtual world that kids create with their friends running on a computer that they learn to build themselves. So like a kit computer. And it's partly made out of wood, looks kind of cool. So that's my pitch done. So I guess I can sit down now, <laughs> no, no such luck. Um, so I thought, well, I'd spend the rest of my time talking about, you can see what the product is, but like, I guess, why? Why do we want to have a, a situation where kids are like building their own computer and creating their own, because it's connected to the internet, they can build things and chat with their friends. Why do we need to give kids the ability to create their own online social spaces? Why is this a thing that's important? Well, the answer is that you failed. Boomers stuffed up, and I include myself as being a boomer in the broader sense of the term. I think it's anybody over 30, isn't it? Is that what generations <laughs> think these days? So, uh, you know, I think that we, the social media that we've created, these social media sites, they're troll factories full of nasty people. And, and I think that, you know, we created this. And now I think that we're trying to tell our kids that this is just the way that it is and they're just going to have to accept this. Um, you know, and I think that the research is becoming more clear. It's like, what has been associated with kids in social media? Anxiety, depression, negative body image, uh, dental caries. <laughs> it's because of all the junk food advertising on social media, right? Too many ads for McDonald's and Coke. And you say about correlations, not causation. Well, actually now we're seeing that, well, you know, there's more research being done that shows maybe there is a causation, that social media actually causes these things. It's not the case that people who are depressed and anxious are more likely to go and, you know, seek out social media. Uh, so, you know, we have these problems, but then Zuck, you know, says we're definitely focusing on kindness and making this a friendly place, threads. I mean, I think this is one of the contradictions in tech, isn't it? That we've built all of this tech that seems to be so terrible, but yet we're promising we'll get it right this time. Just trust me again and, and we'll get it right. Uh, and I think this is a bit absurd, but it's one of the contradictions in tech. We say that we're saving the world, but are we really destroying it? But I've got to a confession to make. And that is, as somebody who works in tech, I'm guilty of this as well, you know, of actually going and creating this technology without really thinking as much as I should about the, the um, social implications. Here's an excerpt from a research paper I wrote probably about 10 years ago now. And I was talking about trying to get people to do more exercise using technology. And I thought, this is a great thing. If I can persuade people to be more physically active, it's for their own good. But I also said you've got this problem of that you need to get people to use the technology. So you need to kind of get them hooked into it, even though it's for their own good. But this could be ethically indefensible if, as you do what Adams et al. suggest, and you use poker machine tactics to try to get people addicted to it. Uh, so one of the reviewers on my paper then said, tell me more about these poker machine tactics. I want to know. I'm really curious. <laughs> you know? I don't think he can't help himself. It's one of these things, you know that you shouldn't do it, but you want to do it. So I'm running this startup company, Making Agape. I've worked in other people's startup companies. I've talked to investors, to venture capitalists in tech. And I'll help you to kind of translate between the things that we say in tech speak and what we really mean in human speak. So in tech speak, we'd say something is, it needs to be sticky. And that means it has to be horribly addictive. You can't stop using it. We talk about metrics. Metrics is just, we want to track everything that you're doing with the technology and spy on you. We want to know what you're up to. A, B testing. 
unregulated psychological experiment. We'll try to push some of you in one direction and some in the other direction and we'll see what happens. No, no ethics committee. Um, find a painful problem and solve for the customer. We're meant to be making your lives better by coming up with great solutions. It really means we invent a problem that you didn't have before and we convince you that you need our solution. And then we make it really addictive so you have to keep using it. Making the world a better place. It means we know what's good for you and we're gonna take charge, thank you. The relationships can be one where we tell you what technology to buy, how much to pay for it and how to use it. So, but we love contradictions in tech. So actually the problem can't be us, it's you. It's your fault. Because as we all know, uh, trolling and hate, it's just human nature. It's just what people do, we can't help it. It doesn't have anything to do with the technology we create, but it's your fault because you're just not using it right. <laughs> so, um, it sounds a little bit like that old um, thing of guns don't kill people, people kill people. I think this is rubbish, actually, personally. I think uh, I go back to Marshall McLuhan, the media theorist, who said the medium is the message. And this means that we get distracted by the content in a medium. We don't criticise the medium itself and how it shapes the messages that are transmitted through it. Um, and I think, think about the character of existing media. It's like you own nothing, everything's a subscription. We own everything and you just visit the spaces that we tell you to come into. You give us free stuff and then we make money out of it by selling that stuff. And privacy, you don't have any privacy because we want to collect all of your data and we want to sell it for money for our own benefit. So are we really surprised then that people behave badly in social media? I'm not really surprised. So what I believe, I don't think the government can really help you. I think that the um, e-safety regulations that are coming through now, probably in five to 10 years time, won't be as useful. Um, I think we're looking at social media becoming distributed, um, becoming federated like Mastodon, and I think that there's no longer gonna be this model necessarily of having big tech companies where you've got you know, big targets that you can go after with regulation. Uh, I think centralised and AI content moderation is weird. Like, we're being asked to accept this new world in which every single time that you have a discussion with anybody online, it's, you know, scrutinised by some unseen moderators or some algorithm. That's strange. Like, what does that do to people psychologically, you know, if they think that somebody else is reading everything they write, whether it's a computer or a person? But I think humans are good at doing community. One of the things I do for fun, I sing in a choir. We've got like 50, 70 people every week come together and sing. And I'm just fascinated how we as humans can create these self-regulating uh, organisations. We're good at being able to create our own sort of uh, rules and our own systems of governance for the better, the, the broader good, without necessarily needing government or AI sitting in over our shoulder all the time. I think coding is dying. I think a lot of coding is going to be done with AI, you know, probably in the next five to 10 years. So it's sort of like, do we want to teach kids to code um, in STEM education? No, I think the future of tech, careers that help us to use technology to better express our own humanness. That's the only possible future tech career in the post AI world. And that's what we need to be teaching kids how to do. Uh, and I think that ownership is the future too. And this is like you're owning things, you're controlling and creating your own online spaces. And you feel a sense, when you feel a sense of ownership over something, I think that you want to make it good. So, you are irrelevant though, sorry to tell you, but you're not going to fix the problem. But your kids might fix the problem. But this is a good thing. I think that we need to, um, it's a little bit hard to sort of accept that if we created the problems, we can't necessarily fix them. Um, but I think that we, uh, you know, need to pass the baton over to kids who are not locked into the existing paradigms. So what is Agape really, going back to what is the product that I'm selling? I suppose it's Meccano for online social spaces. I don't know if anybody remembers Meccano, you know, like the construction kit where you screw together things and you make toys. You know, so it's about giving kids the tools to create their own online social spaces rather than giving them a space that they need to go into. Um, and I think it's giving kids this sort of dangerous idea of like, you could build a computer, you could create an online social space where you set the rules, not somebody else. You know, looking at giving kids encryption as a tool to protect their privacy, seeing it as something that could help children rather than something that's dangerous and to be feared because it's being used by criminals to harm them. So I think my, 
Next slide, I'm talking about, uh, yeah, the computer kit, $499 on pre-order, so it comes in bits and you put it together. Like I said, it's got a Wi-Fi connection, plays music, you can build, you can chat together. We're going to do a $10 a month subscription um, to give, uh, you know, parents and uh, kids access to the cloud so you get new content and you can play online with your friends. Um, why do I think parents will love it? Because it's giving kids something hands-on to do. It's teaching them these post-AI skills about how do we build, create, maintain communities online and take ownership of those communities. Um, and I think why do kids, why would kids love it? Well, it's virtual world building, although, you know, two day, but you know, all kids are already playing Minecraft, Roblox, it's social. I think we need to give kids experiences that are social because that's what they expect out of tech these days. And it's relevant. It's not sort of necessarily turning LEDs on and off, although there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, you know, something that kids already want to do and that will hopefully kind of bring them in. So last final thought. So let's cut the crap, right? Tech billionaires are not going to make the world a better place. I don't think the government is going to make the world a better place. I think you and I are going to make the world a better place, but we're not going to do it by building the technology ourselves. I think we're going to inspire our kids to build that technology. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, next up, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Andrew Duval, who, uh, who is one of the creators uh, of writelike.org and frankenstories.org. He has an MA in script writing from the Australian Film, Television and Radio School. He has won an Augie Award from the Australian Writers Guild, taught middle school, spent 10 years as a creative director and is a two-time Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation guarantee. Uh, please welcome Andrew. All right, so um, I've got like 80 slides or something, so I'm going to blitz it. You just let it wash over you. It will be fine. Um, as our, one of the other presenters said, there's a, yeah, 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 you, a lot, lot of text. Don't read it. I'll, I'll point out what you need to look at. Um, okay, so let's get started. Yeah, I've got a weird background. It's hard to summarise. Um, so I think one useful thing to understand about me is I'm a combination of writer, teacher, and digital design director, um, all of which, any of those three, there are people that are better than me at all of those, but the specific combination is kind of unusual. Um, so one of the things I'm interested in is this guy, blank page, like it's, it's a real problem. Um, I don't like it. Uh, and I'm not the only person, students don't like it either. Like writing achievement scores are a contentious metric anyway, but one thing you can say about them is they never go up. <laughs> they only ever go down or they stay flat. So students find it really hard too. Um, so. Part of my story begins in 2013 when I got the, the Gates Foundation money to work on this thing called Write Like, which is I wanted to make a platform that was about using short form mentor text modeling as a way to learn sort of advanced writing skills. That was kind of the basic idea. So Write Like is this library of lessons like that. They're made up of pages that look like that. They've got like little interactive exercises on them, but basically it boils down to this writing little variations of mentor texts that you sort of get a little interesting pattern for and you apply it to your own content. That's the basic formula. Now the problem with it is it's actually pretty good. It's pretty effective in the same way that going to the gym and doing reps will be effective. You've got to go to the gym, you've got to do the reps. That's the hard part. So like there's an engagement and motivation threshold that's a real issue for it. Um, so a few years later, um, Write Like had always been sort of a side project at, at my old job and then kind of just got sick of doing client work and a couple of us, you know, the Chris, my programmer, we want to go out and just basically focus on it full time, sort of wrap it up and get it finished and, and sort of see what we could do with it. But it was like, if we're going to do this, we need to solve this dopamine engagement issue first. So what do we do about that? So we made Franken Stories, which started off as like a little feature inside it and then sort of just metastasized a little bit. So Franken Stories is a multiplayer creative writing game. And for context, my focus is kind of primarily on sort of middle years, writing, but like this is something sort of scales up and down out of that. So the way it works is students jump in, everyone just jumps into the game, everyone gets a writing prompt, everyone gets the same writing prompt in the group. Uh, you write, you play the game in a series of rounds and the rounds are made up as a series of phases. So a standard game might be like five rounds. So first phase, everyone starts writing simultaneously, there's a little clock, so you might get 90 seconds. Then there's an anonymous voting round where you sort of get to see what your, your peers have written, pick out your favourite and then winners are revealed and, and who got what votes and hearts and all that kind of thing. And then the winning response is like stitched in as like, okay, that's the round one canonical bit. And you dump back into writing again, 90 seconds, keep going. 
Uh, and then you repeat that a number of times, five times or whatever, and you stitch together a story or a text or whatever it is, and there's a bunch of data associated with that. So that's the basic process. Now, when, we, when I describe this to teachers, they recognise and they go, oh, it's like an online version of telephone, like the game where you write something on a sheet of paper, give it to somebody else, they write something, you fold over the first response, you pass it around like that. That is also what I thought we were building, because it was Chris's idea, not mine. He was like, oh, we should do a multiplayer version of this other thing that we had in write like. And I was like, oh, that'll be like telephone. That's, that's what we're fine. It'll be cute. Fine. Um, but actually, once we built it, the first prototype took a couple of weeks, played it for three or four weeks, I was like, oh, it's not telephone at all, it's theatre sports, that's what, that's what this actually is. And if you know anything about theatre sports, you recognise it's much more complicated and, and a rich experience than you might give it credit for. And once you start to see how all the things that I broke up for you individually all sort of stack together in, in, a, in a single interface, you start to realise there's actually a lot sort of going on in these experiences. So I'm going to unpack it a little bit for you in theory terms. So in a game, you can talk about this idea of a call loop. Like, what is the thing you do over and over again in a game? And one of the problems with educational games is most of the time, the core loop of the game is not the educational part. There's a game over here that you every now and then you interrupt to do a quiz, and then you go back to the game. Um, so Franken Stories is actually, you basically write, read, analyze, and adapt for 25 minutes solid, no downtime. And that's fundamentally what writing is. So to come up with something, or to stumble on something, really, where the core loop that you're doing actually matches the thing you want to teach is kind of rare. Um, and if that sounds sort of self-evident, what's interesting is if you compare it to Write Like, it's not actually the same loop. Write Like doesn't have the adaptation step, and you do things in a different order, and the proportions of those step, those, each of those steps are different to what you do in Frank's story. So even if something sounds kind of obvious, it's, sort of, it's actually not in practice. So there are a couple of effects from this loop and the way that we've set it up. So these are some quotes from teachers. They're pretty obsessed with it. Never been so eager to write and read. Can't believe how even the resistant writers have tempted to engage. So there's an engagement effect. So that's the dopamine stuff that I was worried about at the start. And that comes from basically a combination of constant surprise. So each one of these little phases, there's always something different and unexpected happening. There's constant pressure, which needs to be tuned so you don't like, you know, get overwhelmed by it, but like these constant ticking clocks as you go through phases as well as multiple sources of pleasure, right? So there's the craft pleasure of writing and reading something that's good, if it's working. And then there's the social pleasure. So, you know, these various affordances of just, just the validation and feedback from people, as well as the social pleasure of creating this sort of communal thing that you're constructing together. So that's one effect. There's a second effect, which is, you see in these kind of comments, they're getting better at knowing how to make writing more interesting, getting them more invested in the process, greater awareness of a purpose and audience. So there's a learning process that comes out of it as well, which I relate back to some of the learning theories that I'm interested in like. So cognitive load, the idea of everything's broken up into small chunks, you're constantly learning off of examples of other people's writing, that there's a lot of repetition built in the game, so you can sort of build up these kind of complex schema. Um, Genre-based pedagogy, so everything you do is always situated within an actual craft, a text production sort of uh, thing and you're learning lots of um, you know, genre-specific patterns and skills as you play. And then social learning, so the idea of you're learning off of peers constantly, as well as you know, you're, you're learning in a community, as well as you're learning to do a sort of a valid social task, so constructing a text for an audience. So one of the other things the teachers talk about is the degree to which the students love knowing they're writing for each other, that they're their own audience. So, um, and, and, and that sort of learning thing stacks up it's really transferable. So like you get all of that compounded in this environment and then it transfers over when, you know, teachers will do things like the kids will pick up their text from the game and then come and dump, dump it over here and rewrite it and edit and do their own versions and that kind of thing. Third effect, final effect. Um, work in a high poverty school, getting kids to be creative has been a struggle. This has started helping them bring out their imagination. Uh, they really like the collaboration, both the individual part and collaborating on the stories uh, brings us all together. So creativity and collaboration, I think, are two terms that um, uh, I, I think are often spoken about a bit vaguely in education. Um, but I would argue that something like Franker Stories actually helps really target very specific attitudes, sub-skills, components of those two things. So, you know, on a creativity front, actually about observation, free association, combining things together, as well as the way that creativity is related to craft skills and what you can execute. In collaboration, you know, this sort of fundamental value of selflessness, like I was saying to somebody like, um, 
Frankly, stories is a bit like high intensity interval training for your ego, you know, because you're constantly like having to put something out, you know, losing. But then, like, when you lose, even if you don't win that round, you have to then adapt and internalize what the person before you put down anyway. So there's this constant sort of thing. Anyway, so I think it's really powerful in that regard. So all together, you get this kind of engine going where you get this like loop of activity and you get this sort of engagement layer and the learning layer and then this sort of emergent creativity and, and collaboration thing that comes out of it. Now that's all basically a blank kind of format, right? When you think about it, like it's, it's content neutral. So what can you do with it? How do you teach with it? Now I'm going to show a bunch of you're going to see a bunch of stories and all you really need to do is like just look at the, um, the, the, the picture with the blue heading thing like that, otherwise just you'll get overloaded with it. So you can use that blank format to basically teach any genre of writing. So it's called Franken Stories, but you can do any, any type of thing. So you, know, you can do stories like that. Um, this looks like a story, but it's actually a news report about a, uh, a, a collapse of a human pyramid at a community centre. Um, this is an argument about um, whether or not Buff Pikachu is actually a life in the Dreamhouse Barbie character based on hair care routine and uh, aspirational lifestyle. Um, you can use it in any subject. So yeah, English, this is a, a Reddit, um, Am I the Asshole thread for Macbeth? Um, but this is a, a history piece. This is uh, STEM. This is you know, describing uh, herd immunity. This is one of my favorites, which is trying to describe an electrostatic reaction from the point of view of an electron, which is a great way to prove because I play this game, I'm player number two. I was robbed because I was the only person who did research before the game. So I know how it works now and nobody else in the game did. They all voted for the wrong description. But um, yeah, but that's a really interesting way to sort of uh, uh, explore a STEM topic. Um, you can do whole text or parts text or isolate particular skills. So this is a story, but the instructions are actually getting players to focus on specific types of prepositional phrase each round. This is just not even worrying about an entire argument, but looking at different types of issue that you could create out of something and just, just brainstorming on those. Uh, this is an observation game, so mining a stimulus systematically for ideas, not just what's literally there, but what you might sort of find looking in and out of it. People play in any language. So these are people playing their native language, like French speakers, German speakers, but you can obviously play in a second language too for, for language training. Um, you can play with any size of group and you'll just get different types of experiences. So this is a 25 player game with really long time limits. I think this is like an after school writing group, but this is a one player game where somebody basically just uses it as like seven minutes timed writing, 90 seconds, you've got to drop something out. And some of the best Franken stories are literally just one player games that were spun up in five minutes and yeah, you know, like this one, like Chloe's just the worst, you know, so. Um, and you can integrate it into an authentic writing process. So it's, it's a bit sort of front loaded for sort of the brainstorming ideation sort of thing. But this is an example of playing to brainstorm on ideas for an outback trip, like a romantic love triangle outback road trip gone wrong. Then that's an outlining game. And then that was a script that came out of that process. So, um, you know, mileage will vary, like everything needs reality check, like there's all sorts of things that can sort of, you know, like um, um, not entirely work with this process, but you know, like I, I think what's good about it is even if you've got sort of things going wrong, this is the kind of thing that is well suited towards teacher expertise. So like what this teacher is saying here is they're describing a mode in the game where the teacher can observe what the players are writing and as they're submitting responses, the teacher can basically whack them all them if they're derailing the story. So sometimes kids will write really trolling responses. So you've got to have this kind of iron fist, velvet glove kind of affordance. But what this teacher is doing is taking that mode of the game, projecting it up onto the whiteboard and creating like a second voting round where the entire class looks at everyone's things and the entire class votes to eliminate things that they think are a waste of time and discuss all that stuff. And then they go to the anonymous voting round. So I think things like that where, you know, teachers can take very sophisticated approaches to a really open-ended tool are, are important. So yeah, basically it's taking this big beast, turning it into this kind of different sort of experience, taking that engine and you create this kind of, you know, effect basically. And so if you want just basic sort of business stuff, like where are we up to, like there are different ways of describing this, but essentially End of last year, we were over the sort of thousand monthly active user threshold, which includes teachers and students. So about 10% of those would be teachers. By June, we were over the 10,000 threshold, two thirds of those in the US, nobody pays. Like there's a tiny fraction of people who pay. Most people use the free version. 
and um, you know we're launching some new stuff in the next couple of weeks. Will hopefully be enough to make people sort of start to pay. It's just that sort of long climb up the up the user ladder, basically, and trying to make it sustainable in some way. So that's that's it. That's my story. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so our uh, last speaker is Troy Merritt, who is the co-director of Bitlink, a technology and education company based in Launceston, uh, Tasmania. Bitlink develops educational resources that aims to improve teacher confidence in design and digital technologies. Troy is also a PhD candidate at the University of Tasmania, researching the very timely issue of children's privacy and the Internet of Things. Please welcome Troy. Thank you. All right, I'll, uh, I just threw these slides together last night. So uh, because generally when I'm talking to teachers about this, I'll go on for half an hour to an hour. So uh, hopefully this will keep me to time. Um, but yeah, basically I'm from a company called Bitlink and we are a technology education company. We're based in Launceston, Tasmania um, and we're educational designers. So we like to build educational content for teachers to deliver. And we've got about 10 years of experience working with schools. So in terms of what have we done, Bitlink has been on a journey for 10 or so years. Um, and it's uh, um, a company that started off, it was, uh, I met James, the, uh, the, the founder of Bitlink, um, when I went to do my masters at the University of Tasmania. And after I finished that, um, we started doing some software development projects together. Um, we, did some work with universities and we were always prototyping little niche um, things that they couldn't get a, a proper developer to uh, to do because it was too small of a job. So we did a little bit of that sort of work. Then we got involved with starting a maker space that we ran for five years uh, at the um, QV Mag Museum in Launceston, which was a great experience for us. Um, we never got a dollar of funding to run this thing. It was run 100% on volunteer hours and a hell of a lot of tears, um, and, but we loved it. We loved doing it, but eventually we burnt out. Um, we also did all these other crazy kooky projects like we built interactives for museums. We built a theme park ride, which was a 15 minute dark ride with animatronics and, uh, and projections and um, all sorts of things. Um, but alongside doing all of this, whenever we were doing these, these weird development projects, we were always doing educational work as well, whether that was in the maker space or working directly with schools. So we did after school programs, we did school holiday programs. Um, we went to schools and did workshops um, and we trained teachers as well. So it was always around the kinds of things we were doing with these software development projects, but we, we had a passion for education. So we kept finding ourselves doing that sort of work. We were really lucky we had an opportunity to, uh, to seek some funding um, as part of the smart cities um, funding that uh, the Launceston City Council was applying for. They wanted to do an education project and they came to us because they knew we did a lot of education work and they said, what are the problems you're seeing in schools and um, how can we, we address some of that? So we'd seen a lot of different problems and, and one of our um, most common things is that we knew that we could walk into pretty much any school in Tasmania and um, we would go in with electronics kits, little Arduino kits and um, and the school would go, oh, we've got some of those. Um, and they take us to a cupboard and there's 10 kits and one's been opened and the teachers looked at this and going like, this isn't gonna work. Um, the kits that they were using just weren't designed for schools. We also um, saw there's just no resources for them. These things are designed for tinkerers, they're not designed for teachers. We saw problems with key person dependencies in schools. Some schools had what we call STEM champions, the wonderful teachers, very, very good at what they do. Um, and the problem is that if you're really good at doing this, um, schools want you to do more of it or other schools want you to come and do it. So there were key person dependencies, teachers moved around a lot, they got promoted. Um, it was hard for a school to maintain a STEM program. Um, and once you had good specialists in these spaces, they could do really amazing things, but they were constantly having to do this and we wanted to see something that other teachers could use as well. And the last problem we saw was just around literacy. Um, so we're um, based in Tasmania and I've lived in Tasmania for um, about 11 years now. Um, and sadly, um, we, we have a lot of literacy challenges in Tasmania. Um, so what did we do? We took that funding and 
we developed a new kit and this is the kit that we built. It's here, it's in a calico bag, which I was 100% wrong about when um, we were talking about packaging. I said calico bags will never work, but teachers love them because kids love to dump them out on their desks um, and sort through for all the bits. So it's basically, it's a kit designed around the BBC micro bit. Wonderful little physical computing product. Um, got a great block based coding language um, that they use with it. Um, we've curated a, a selection of sensors to go with that. So we don't actually build anything. We put everything together in the kits. Um, we've designed this all with students and classrooms in mind. So it's all designed for grades three through six. Um, we did some really nice things with the packaging, with um, very visual packaging um, for the components within the kits, um, resealable bags and things to make it very classroom friendly. But the kit is probably the least interesting thing we do. So the kit was 100% designed to support the lessons and the outcomes we wanted to make. So we knew that the resources were the important things. So what did we do? We worked with uh, 10 different schools in, uh, in Launceston and surrounds, um, and we co-designed with the teachers, 10 different teachers, we co-designed lessons. So we ended up making 20 curriculum linked lessons to go with this kit. Um, and the lessons led what ultimately ended up in the kits. We created uh, resources for the teachers, including slide decks, lesson plans, um, and solution code um, for all of the projects that were in there. Um, and this was all based down to the things we saw when we were doing the pilots around different teaching styles and the things we could do to support as many different teaching styles as we could. We had 10 teachers. We saw 10 different ways of trying to teach STEM content. What we wanted to design um, was something um, with a low floor, very wide walls and a very high ceiling. Um, so I'm stealing from MIT Media Lab talking about that. But we wanted to design something that any teacher could pick up because we saw a lot of problems with teacher confidence. Um, teachers were just scared to get into teaching design and digital technologies because they felt they had to be experts in it. The first lesson in our sequence of lessons is so simple, um, it's impossible to fail. Um, it is just get the micro bit to show a number. Um, it is so easy. We give it to third graders and they get it like that. If it takes them 15 seconds, um, that's a really long time. Um, so we designed that as our first lesson simply to teach kids about how to get some code actually up and happening on the micro bit, but also so teachers can't help but get through that first lesson and realize actually I can do some of this. So that's a really important thing for us. One of the things we do with our lessons is our lessons are not tutorials. Everything's designed as a series of challenges. And this came from the teachers that we were working with. They didn't want just here's a list of instructions, go and follow that. They wanted something that was going to be more engaging for students to work with. So we've designed, every lesson is designed as a series of challenges um, that, that students complete. And it's all scaffolded. So there's always things they know how to do and we're adding in one new element. The last thing that we wanted to do with the lessons was give teachers lots of scope to be able to expand and do more with this. So we basically make it very easy for teachers to remix projects, to change things. Um, and we're really not, um, we, we like to joke that what we've built are serving suggestions, they're not recipes. We don't want teachers to just lean on what we've done. We want to give them the ability to change and adapt these things as well. So, we were really interested in design and digital technologies curriculum. So we chose the Internet of Things, um, the idea of all of these tiny little computers that are out there in the world sensing the real world. And we chose those as the hook. Um, and that was a really good one because it brought real world themes into the classroom. So we ended up designing 20 lessons across four different themes. So our introductory module is called Meet Microbit. It's all about um, just getting to know that micro bit board, what all the sensors on board do. But then we've got a module on smart homes, a module on smart farms, and a module on smart cities that take you through projects um, that have these themes. Another thing we wanted to do was to show kids, show students that these are the kinds of things that people do for a job. So we went out and we did interviews with a lot of Tasmanian companies that use the Internet of Things. So people that build Internet of Things devices, people that implement Internet of Things devices, people that make sense of the data that's out there. So we made little modules with farmers, with um, people that worked in city council um, uh, that were, were using these data and these insights. 
And the last thing that we wanted to do was to make it visual. So we leaned really heavily on um, video in this. So whenever we introduce a new device, we have little video um, snippets to do uh, to introduce them. One of the big challenges we'd seen when teaching electronics is that students would often um, take an Arduino and they build the circuit on the breadboard and they copy in the, the code that's been given to them and they sit there and they put their hand up and they say, oh, is this, is this finished? Is it, is it working? They didn't actually know what working or done looked like. So we try to do that with our challenges. We show them the behaviour that we want and, um, and we um, basically, we, we make that very visual for them. Um, we also use block-based coding um, because the, the block-based systems, um, we use make code um, for the micro bits, which articulates nicely into um, text-based coding as well. Um, but that was a really nice um, way to, to get around some of the literacy challenges. Everything's color coded and, and children can understand what the blocks are saying, even in grade three, when they may not necessarily um, be able to read some of those, um, the, some of the, the blocks that are there. We did one more thing with video as well, um, which is we went and made a TV show. Um, now, when we were given some funding to do this, they didn't say make a TV show, they said use video. And in every other parallel universe, it's just me and James um, sitting there telling kids, this is what you're gonna do in today's lesson. But we wanted to do something more interesting than that. So we made a TV show, we called it Maker's Treehouse. Um, and it uh, was a lot of fun to make. We shot 37 episodes in two weeks, um, which is not a production schedule I would recommend. Um, but basically, Maker's Treehouse wraps around every lesson that we do. So they are our video intros and our video outros for every lesson. Um, we hired four wonderful um, college students to be like the older brother um, or, and older sister to, to model some behavior that we wanted and to set up the problem that we have. Um, every intro would talk about a problem that they were having that conveniently can be solved with a micro bit. Um, and then there would be an outro video for every lesson as well where they, they recap and they, um, they talk about how they solved that problem. So they, sh they, they don't go through the code in great detail, but they talk through the concepts. And this was important to us because it helped us to model behaviours we wanted in the classroom. Everything we do is designed for pairs of students, so we wanted to focus on collaboration. We wanted to focus on resilience as well, so the videos show that it doesn't always work the first time. Sometimes you have to make some changes. Uh, I know that uh, time is tight, so I'll just talk about what we're doing now. So basically, we are continuing to develop material um, for the IoT kits. Um, we're doing a lot of engagement work with teachers. We're running a series of events called PL in the Pub because we want to bring teachers together um, and we figure the best way to do that is with beer. Um, so we actually get um, educators to talk about their practice in a pub um, and uh, have a drink and that's really, um, we're starting to get some momentum on that in the north of Tasmania. Um, we're also one of our first big customers outside of the project was actually we started selling them to libraries and museums. And it turns out that the kit that we spent um, 18 months developing specifically for classrooms isn't exactly the right thing for libraries and museums. So we're actually working on that solution as well. We're also um, exploring partnerships at the moment because ultimately we're an impact focused company. Um, we're not out there to make a lot of money um, with what we do. We're really just trying to get this kit into as many schools as we can because we think it's a really great solution. And that's really where we are now. We're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, it turns out that James and I, we love educational design, we hate sales. Um, so we are trying to figure out what the best way to get this product out to, to more schools. And uh, yeah, if anyone's got any suggestions, you can come and find me after the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Trey. So I'll invite our uh, EdTech uh, specialist to take a seat up here. Um, and so this is going to be like a Q&A discussion if you'd like to take a seat, yeah, just up front. Um, so we'll have a roving mic as well, but um, I'm gonna have facilitator privileges and um, <laughs> ask my questions first. Because something that I have, something that I'm uh, really curious about, um, I think especially given some of the discussions and presentations that we've had um, today, I'd really like to hear from each of the speakers around what are some of the challenges or barriers that you've personally faced in the ed tech space or things that you've seen or come up against in terms of either practices or values or issues in terms of funding. So um, I'll hand it over to the three of you. 
Uh, so I suppose um, one of the things I found for me was trying to work out <clears throat> if I have a product, am I selling it directly to parents or am I going to schools and teachers and school systems? Because um, that's a sort of a decision. They're quite different markets, I guess, selling to schools. It's potentially, you know, you can sort of um, make more sales than you're developing, you know, professional development material and you're having to create relationships with schools and teachers, which can be time consuming. Um, I suppose with parents, it's sort of you can... Um, you know, reach out and be able to create a relationship and make sales more quickly, but then, uh, you, you know, customer acquisition costs might be higher. I suppose in terms of funding, it's, I guess if you talk to investors in the tech space, there's certain kinds of products and services that they really, really like. And some of those are like business to business software as a service in the cloud. That's a big thing. Um, you know, um, phone apps, uh, sort of two sided marketplaces where people are buying and selling and you can take a cut of the money. Uh, ed tech, maybe not so much. <laughs> so I think that's perhaps a challenge is, is sort of um, having investors be able to see the potential in ed tech. But then, you know, that's always then in terms of dollars and cents, right, so. Pick this one up. Uh, so we had a, an interesting challenge. Um, when we were funded to develop these kits, uh, the funding included donating a classroom set, which is 15 kits, to 40 schools in the Launceston and Surrounds area. Um, and that was a big incentive for us to do this project, was to uh, the fact that the schools would get these kits at the end of it. Um, and we had great engagement from a lot of the schools, um, obviously our pilot schools and um, probably about half the schools overall were really engaged. Probably about another quarter of them were less engaged and were a bit harder to, um, to just explain everything to. Um, and then we had about a quarter of the schools that like we were trying to give them a $3,000 kit with it had like 18 months worth of R&D gone into developing these lessons. Uh, and it was almost impossible. It was, I was literally down to the last couple of schools driving the, to schools, knocking on principals' doors and having to book meetings. Um, and the thing that we've found is it's just, it's really difficult to cut through the noise sometimes. So, um, and not every school, like we're, we're very focused on STEM education and some schools, STEM education just is not a priority for them. They have bigger challenges um, just around getting kids into the classrooms. and. Um, and that can be really hard um, to even think about what they're going to do for a STEM program. Um, so that's been a big challenge. Um, that was an initial challenge for us, and it's, it's a challenge that we've, we've seen since that as well. So um, we've made sales to most states um, in the country now, um, but the, predominantly we're still selling into Tasmania. We've got good networks on the island. There's good word of mouth getting around about the kits and about what they can do for schools. But once we get off the island, it's that Bass Strait, it's, it's only this big, but it's, it's huge. Um, it's, we just don't have the networks there, so it's, it's much harder for us to, to try to get into. Even though there's 200 schools in Tasmania, uh, 2,000 schools or something in New South Wales, it's like the, the market is so much bigger, but it's, yeah, it's difficult to be a little Tassie company trying to sell to the rest of Australia, let alone the, the world, which is our global ambition. So. Yeah. Um Basically, I'm, I'm going to reiterate both of these uh, in my own way. So uh, I think challenge number one is actually getting access to teachers and students to try anything out with. And that's completely reasonable because everyone's time poor and everyone's busy and it's kind of a high stakes thing to go in and test stuff in classrooms and everything. On the other hand, if you can't solve that, it's really hard to make anything that sort of moves the needle on stuff. So that's a real dilemma. And yeah, the the basically capital allocation is all messed up. <laughs> you know, like it's all messed up in society generally, but like this is one where it's really difficult. And I think there are, the, the, the problem is educational sales is kind of like the worst of B2C, like business to consumer sales and B2B sales. It's, it's the worst of both of them combined. And I think what happens is you wind up with this really perverse economic system, right? So if you're in ed tech, as it were, you're really incentivized because it's so difficult to sell to teachers and students individually, you're incentivized to basically go to uh, sort of schools, departments, district kind of level. But the people who are buying at that level don't have the same interests and alignment as the teachers and students. So you're selling to a different audience with different incentives who basically are in the market for two things. One is sort of surveillance cop tech, you know, like let's, let's monitor what everyone's doing. Or 
they want to do like whole of whole whole monolithic solutions. So give us the entire STEM curriculum, give us the entire English curriculum, give us the entire school curriculum, whatever. And you cannot do a good job of anything if you're doing a monolithic solution like that. So you're left with this. I would, I would probably guess that like all three of us are interested in actually doing these pretty niche learning experiences. That um, it's yeah, it's hard to get the sale pathway in, and we're not interested in like dominating the entire curriculum in a school, and it leaves you kind of really trapped. And so, and also like the purchasing cycles in schools quite long. Teachers need to take time to get up to speed with what you want to do, which means everything really drags out. So there's a real fight for survival when you're occupying this niche in the industry to just stay alive long enough that people start to adapt and, yeah, catches on, basically. Those yeah. are the challenges. Yeah, just a small amount. <laughs> I'm opening up to the floor. Is there any questions that anyone would like to ask our EdTech experts? If not, I have some other questions to ask them. So we're, classic two sides of the coin. So speaking about the challenges and the barriers, I'm also really curious to know what are some of the opportunities or insights that um, that you've personally gained by being within the ed tech space? Go first. You me to go first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Insights that I've gained. I mean, I suppose, you know, you probably would have picked up from my talk a kind of a sense of how screwed we are. I guess. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think thinking about what we just spoke about in terms of selling into school systems and to teachers, there is that incentive to go with the monopoly players in that there's a strong feeling of I want to buy something that I already have, that I already know about, or I want to buy it from the ecosystem that I already have and I'm familiar with. I'm already with Google, I'm with Microsoft, I just want to buy a Google product, a Microsoft product. It makes that harder for um, startup players to get into the market. Um, I think, um, yeah, I suppose in terms of insights, you know, everything that was said today, I mean, about, for example, like data that's collected through platforms that are used within schools, and it's sort of like, well, parents have little to no control over that, children have little to no control over that. So I think for me, it's just about, and it's, you know, maybe going to be an impossible narrative to push, but pushing that narrative of like, if you build things yourself and you um, have ownership of something and have control over something, I think that's the way forward. Um, and I think people are starting to become more aware of the ills of these sort of monopolistic tech players who are dominating the market and who are doing these kind of, you know, somewhat evil things. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're going to start making conscious choices to sort of work against that, hopefully. So. My insight is, um, I'll, I'll go with a, a, a real the, like the most positive thing is like we just bloody love teachers like mm -hmm. it's we came into this project admiring what teachers do and like we have just walked away with a tenfold of um appreciation of what teachers do and how hard their job is um it's um i, I feel like the teaching profession um, gets incredibly devalued sometimes by society is that it's it's that thing that people do because they couldn't get another job and it's like that's man it's that it's so hard to be a teacher and anything that we can do to unlock what is the most valuable resource in the classroom which is time um that's that's something that we try really hard to do and we you know we when we were prototyping and developing these kits we went over things again and again to iterate to get to what's that thing that's going to give teachers that little bit more time to be able to explain this concept or get to that best version of that um yeah, we, we love teachers, so that's, that's, that's my insight. Yeah, right. Sucking up to the crowd. <laughs> uh, um, I'll, 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 I'm going to go a bit off-piste with this one because, like, I don't really have an answer about EdTech specifically, but, like, because there's a lot of academics uh, in this room, I think I'll, I'll take a more general thing, which is kind of something I picked up over, over the years, which is the way in which you can... All right, so my, my, my comment is about, like, the relationship between sort of research and theory and practice, basically, and the degree to which you can generate new knowledge and extend on theory by making things, I think is kind of something I've really learned. And it's because, like, in some of the projects I've worked on, particularly in the past, you'll sort of bump into 
discussions about, you know, what's the evidence for this? Does the evidence base support this? And what? It's like, we're making the evidence base. Like, this is how we make the evidence. We make the thing and we put it out and we figure out what happens and then we make an evidence base out of that. And I talked about some of the, some of the theory sort of stuff in Franklin stories, even for instance, theatre sports, right? So like I've got all of Keith Johnson's books, that's how I recognise it when, when I go, oh, this is theatre sports, it's because of my exposure to it in the past. So Keith Johnson has a bunch of books where he's written out essentially like a theory base for theatre sports and improvised drama and storytelling, things like that. Turns out it's very flaky. When you put it into digital practice, it's fine when you're doing it in theatre in that context and it's live and interpersonal. Sometimes when you have to embed things in a new form factor or a new type of experience, you put pressure on bits of theory or bits of research or something like that that it wasn't previously subjected to. And in putting it under that pressure and trying to execute it to that degree, you discover new things and you push it forward a little bit. And I think that's really valuable. And so I think that sort of interplay between research, theory, development, practice, and then feeding back into these cycles and trying to sort of mature and evolve theory out of that is, is a really interesting interplay and opportunity. Yeah, wonderful. Oh, we have a question from the audience. Please, Kate. Hey, yeah, I was just thinking about this thing about how do you, you know, like more reach for how do you get into more classes and stuff like that. And it's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a conundrum because there's all these gatekeepers along the way hey, that, are, that sometimes block. I'm not going to say anything that you don't know, but I'm just going to say that one of the things that maybe it might not be the centre of excellence for digital child, but it might be somebody else because it's the shoulder to shoulderness. And as soon as you don't have competition between all the ed startups, and they work together to create a, um, a pathway into schools is probably where the strength is going to be. But it might not be you, it might be um, finding somebody who does that, who puts, in, who puts in the time to build relationships directly with schools that then champion, um, champion new products through, you know what I mean? Like so sometimes it's not about you telling everybody how good it is, it's somebody else telling um, the teachers, how, how good you are, or what the value is it, and having kids review it, and you know, do you know what I mean? Like, so having this kind of bigger picture, does that exist in the ed tech startup for this in the digital world? Can, can I pick up on two things that you're saying? Like, one is this was literally uh, the question slash comment I wanted to make about your presentation because you talked about collaboration with other entities of that, and. Again, this is just another thing from sort of my previous job as well. Like we would work on a bunch of largely sort of big government projects and it was always a real priority for us to play nice in the ecosystem, right? Like make space for everyone, join everything together, that kind of thing. And it's, it's actually kind of rare. And like, and again, particularly in like the not-for-profit sector, there's a lot of like, it's all social good, but actually the economics are limited funding pool, really cutthroat. Chasing the same dollar, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it makes everyone really vicious at the same time as like putting on this air of like, hey, we're all gonna, like, yeah. it's gonna be great. Uh, so I just want to say that for you personally, is like, I, I totally appreciate that. And the thing that you're describing about, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I think like the dynamic that you're talking about is right. I think it's really interesting that we were at QUT and again, old job, used to work on these innovation sprints for Queensland government with Liquid. So it was a partnership between QUT uh, chair and Digital Economy, us and Queensland Government, we'd be presented these poorly formed problems, one of which one time was about economic development uh, uh, in, in, in the state. And one of the recommendations out of that, because on these sprints you get like two weeks to work on a prototype something up and some, some of them were kind of complex. But one of the recommendations from that particular sprint was we need like a producer type role, like a Hollywood producer type role, as in somebody whose job it is is just to be like a Rolodex and go around matchmaking, basically. Somebody's got domain and industry expertise, you need like a little squad of them. But it's like, yeah, you've got like one or two education people whose job it is just to roam around and go, that's interesting, that's interesting, that university thing, whatever, that private thing, let's put something together, let's make some stuff happen. Because like you need that kind of like matchmaking kind of function in things and like that's how, you know, that's how Hollywood works. Like that's how some of these big industries work is with that. So anyway, that was something that, I don't think the government ever took up, but I still think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think it's a good idea too, because I think it's that isn't it interesting, because it's not just you, it's every student who's sitting in a university today who's thinking and dreaming up these things. Yeah, totally. And we, we all hit, the, everybody hits the same spot of how do you market to schools. Yeah. Um, and so it just my secret mission has been not to market to schools and to find another way in. And so I sell everything to local government and local government distributes to the schools. Yeah. And so the, the schools get it for free, but the local government pays the licence fee to me because I'm a business yeah. as well, as well as being 
a lovely person and really wanting to save the planet, <laughs> I have to pay everybody on, yeah. on my team, you know, like, so, so do you know what I mean? Like, so this is, this is the thing I came up with. Who is the middle person who benefits from having this distributed to kids to try and find who that person is? And so when you're deciding to do to science, to museums and to libraries, to charge them a fee that then when a library buys it, they, they buy X amount of kits that get distributed to schools. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like trying to find ways to, I'm, I'm, I know you guys think about this all the time. I suppose what I want to do is reinforce that that out of the box thinking until we get to a stage where we've got something that is a little bit more um, collab, not, not, I don't even mean, I just mean good business that there's somebody who is representing and making those inroads to schools so that there is a way for you to be, to giving things because the digital child is new. It's, mm. not, it's, not a typic, it's not a typical thing that we're not selling a book to the library, you guys are selling programs and teachers are used to getting them for free, programs for free, and then sharing them with all their teacher friends. Like as soon as they even get them, they share them. And so we've even had to put a writer in when we have a teacher sign on. We say, please don't share this <laughs> because yeah. we can't focus. Your support is, you know, your support is helping us. Unless, mm. you know, like you can share it within your own LGA because they've paid for it. But this other LGA, please don't share it with them. So, Well, yeah. um, just building on that, we're coming close to time. But I'd be really curious to know, uh, Lauren and Troy, how, in your experience of this idea of this kind of finding this um, middleman or the, the distributor, have you had some, have you kind of faced that or had some successes within that? Yeah, it's, we've, um, we've been fortunate a couple of times to, um, to do a couple of partnerships and projects um, and our standard offer now is that um, you know the kids get uh, the kids go to the schools. Um, let's find someone that will pay for to donate these to schools, and then we will go and do PL and we will do programs, or we will do some new development. So we've just done a um, a project around advanced manufacturing in the north of Tasmania, where we've worked with a couple of high schools, but we've also gone out to industry and we've made more videos with um, with companies in the advanced manufacturing sector. Um, we were lucky to get some funding from NBN to visit some really far-flung um, schools to um, go and work with the, the communities there and, um, and donate some kits. And, and certainly our preferred business model is someone give us money so we can give this stuff away for free. Um, we, thought <coughs> we thought our business model would be that we would have a subscription for teachers and would continually generate new resources and it's, we just like, no, nah, that's just... That mm. we don't want teachers to have to buy this. We want we want to sell kits uh, and have the resources made available for free. So um, I think there are um, there's definitely uh, middlemen out there. It's just getting into those networks. Like the the hardest one I think for a company like us that build an education product is, um, that is really content for schools um, is that a lot of departments of education um, have funding to do that themselves and they don't want to give it to an outside yeah, that's company. Right. Mm -hmm. But the good news is you've got all these fans today yes. who are going to go away and, and talk about how, how great every, the that, three of you were. Mm -hmm. My nice. question about Frankenstory, sorry, I'm being a bit of a hog on the questions, but <laughs> um, can you play it across schools? Like, does it have to be played within the one school or can they play it no. across multiplayer schools? Yeah, well, like, that's all open. Just yeah. send out a code, whoever wants to go in, go in infinite players if you want. Yeah. Be chaotic, but you know. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> but it's, it's fantastic. Great work. You know. Excellent. Well, I, I just really also want to hold space. Um, Lauren, I want to hold space for you to, to maybe answer one quick little last question of saying, you know, what are you really excited about in the future of the ed tech space? Oh, I'm really excited about. I'm excited about, I think, being able to not lock kids into the same paradigms that we might be locked into. I think we've got a particular sort of way of seeing the world now of like, it's all about, you know, what Google wants, it's Microsoft, it's Amazon, it's the big players. We don't really have any choice but to sort of do what they want to do. Um, you know, we buy their technology, you know, AI is going to take all of our jobs away. I mean, all this sort of stuff. I think what I'm excited about with EdTech is the potential to kind of convey a mindset to our kids that they don't need to be locked into that same belief system. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm really trying to do here with this kind of product is show that it's really 
it's simple. It's not complicated. Like you might think it's complicated when you look at it. It is a little bit complicated. But the, the hardware and the software that you need to put together to create like your own computer and your own social network, it doesn't have to be super duper complicated. It doesn't have to be like only Google can do this with a thousand engineers, you know, like only Amazon can do this with a billion dollars. And I think to give kids this idea of like, if you don't like the way that the world is, is kind of going and you don't like these paradigms, you can be empowered to change them. I think that's really important. That's a wonderful note to end on. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our, our speakers, Lauren from Agape, Troy from Bitlink, uh, and Andrew from Frankenstories. Thank you so much.